Hey guys, welcome to Bethel Online. My name is Jason, I'm one of the pastors here, and we're so glad you decided to make us a part of your weekend. No matter who you are, where you come from, we're so glad you're here. Our vision is to be a safe place for real people to encounter the real Jesus and experience real change. Our hope and our prayer is that no matter who you are or what you've been through, you know that you are loved and you are wanted here. We would love to get to know you better and help you connect with all that's going on. You can do this by going to our website at www.bethel.us or by downloading the Bethel app. You can find our app by searching Bethel Putco in your app store. Both online and in the app, you can fill out digital connection card. It only takes a minute and it'll help us know how to serve you better. Another way you can connect today is through giving. Your generosity at Bethel directly impacts God's mission to radically change people's lives in Putnam County and beyond. Through the ministries of Bethel and the many local and regional organizations we support, people are able to see the grace of God and how much He loves them. You can always give on our website at Bethel.us forward slash give or in the Bethel app. Thank you for partnering with us and making a difference. Well, thanks again for tuning in online today. Know that you are wanted and welcome here, and you are loved. I hope you all have a great day. Good morning and welcome to Bethel. We've been in a series called Lose the Weight. Isn't it easy to pick up things over time that begin to weigh us down? Maybe it's on the emotional level, maybe it's worry, maybe it's insecurities, maybe we've built up some sense of envy toward others, but we can really build up a bunch of extra weight that slows us down and hinders us. I think it's true with those emotional things, but let's talk today about stuff. I mean, you probably, if you were honest with yourself, have more stuff than you actually need. You probably have stuff that you don't need. You probably don't just have stuff that you don't need. You have stuff that you don't need that you're never going to need, but you can't get rid of. If you've ever gone through the home of somebody after they passed away and you've walked through and looked through and said, why did they keep this? What was the, the reason? You, you may have even had a dumpster outside the home where as you brought stuff out, you threw stuff away that for some reason the person before held on to. And more than anywhere else in the world, there's this lie that we hear that more is better in our culture, that having more is better than having less. But the reality is that many of us are nearly crippled by our stuff. We, we have so much stuff that maybe we wouldn't even entertain a move because of the thought of moving our stuff. Or maybe we can't get away from the place where our stuff is because and have an experience of a vacation or something like that because of the stuff that we have to maintain. And there's this lie in our culture that says when I get the next thing, I'm going to be completed. I think it's a lie that we often buy into early. We think if I get this thing for Christmas that I want, and yet we play with the thing two times or three times. I remember when my son was little, he wanted Bob's electronic workshop from Bob the Builder. And he asked for that every day before Christmas, every day before Christmas. And on Christmas morning, he got really excited about Bob's electronic workshop. It's one of my favorite videos. The, the only thing great that came out of Bob's electronic workshop is the 30 second video of him losing his mind when he got it for Christmas. And then it was placed on the floor in his room and it was basically never used. And just a few years later, he didn't blink when I said, hey man, I'm gonna get rid of this and give it away. Now the experience we took great value from of watching him and the joy he had that morning, but. As I walked by that thing over time, I would begin to have, be like, oh man, he never used that. But we have this mindset that if I get that, you know, when I grow up, if I get the house, if I get the car, when I finally can afford the new vehicle, when, when I can get the big screen, when I can, and, and all of the sudden things that we once thought were the next thing become an X thing. And we don't even use it anymore, but our lives can be weighed down with stuff. And the truth is, there's a biblical idea that talks about this. 
And, and I would put it into words like this. It's better to have less of what doesn't matter and more of what does. The older that I get, I, I still have some things that are sentimental to me that I hold on to that I, I would never get rid of or let go of probably um, because of sentimental reasons. But what I've found is the thing that I really value is the memory or the experience. If you were to go talk to my children and be like, hey, what's the thing that you'd like more of? And they would say more of those times where we're on a beach together as a family, more of those times where um, we played in the backyard, more of those times when we did something, when we experienced something together. And the older that I get, the more I realize it's not necessarily about the next thing. And sometimes the next thing becomes the X thing because it just starts to weigh us down. There was a season in our life where we wanted to camp on weekends. And then there was a season of life where the camper sat still. And now we're in a season of life where we're like, hey, I don't even know that we need this camper anymore. And some of us are living that where we've thought the next thing was going to be the best thing. Only to find it about to be a next thing. And I would say that it's better to have less of what doesn't matter and more of what does. I've, I've been a part of many people's lives over the years as a pastor. And after a person passes away, um, I, I've seen people nearly go to war over things. But in healthy situations, what I hear is people talking about their memories and experiences of people. The love given, not the things received. And I really do believe when it comes to the life of a Christ follower, it's better to have less of what doesn't matter and more of what does. Your grandchildren will not remember the make of model of a single car that you own. And yet, so many of us think the next one will be the best one. It'll meet our need. Better, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, 6. This is written kind of about Solomon. If there was ever a man who had the opportunity to experience this truth and find it true, it was Solomon. He was one of the wealthiest kings. He was the wealthiest king of his day. And Solomon came to this conclusion after having experienced all that the world had to offer when it came to things. Much of what the world had to offer in the way of pleasure and stuff he said, it's better to have one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. It, imagine it like this. If, if all you've done is grab and grab and grab for the next thing, your hands are so full, you couldn't receive what was coming to you anyway. That merely holding on to all the things in your hand. Just today, I had some groceries delivered to the house and I was carrying everything. You know how you try to like carry it all at one time and make one trip into the house or one trip into where you're going. And I had these two containers holding a bottled tea and I was, <coughs> I was carrying them by the handle and I had bags, you know, up the arm, you know how you get like four or five bags up the arm, you use them like a coat hanger and, and you almost wear it like a badge that you carried everything in. And all of a sudden one of those containers with bottles of tea started to rip and all the tea went everywhere. All of a sudden, my attempt at grabbing a hold of everything and holding on to everything became futile because it was total chaos with the tea bottles falling everywhere all over the place. I think many of us live our lives when it comes to stuff and we don't realize that our stuff has us. We don't have our stuff. When your stuff begins to control your life, your ability to seek after those experiences and those moments that really matter. At the end of the day, what you maybe provide for your kids, we need to provide for our families, but maybe that's not as important as the moments you create. Maybe it's not as important as being present in the relationships that matter. Solomon came to this very conclusion that it's better to have one handful of tranquility than two handfuls with toil. What he's saying here is it's better to have a cup of water than to double fist. You can't drink two cups at once. And you certainly won't enjoy the moment while your hands are tied up carrying things. And two handfuls with toil and chasing with the wind. No one wants to be trying to catch the wind. And what he's saying here is you can't. That sometimes that next mark of the next thing becomes so important in our life that it becomes an idol. And, and when that happens, we're not able to live in the peace that God intended for us to live in. 
Luke chapter 12, verse 15 says it this way. Watch out. I mean, parents, you're walking down the street with your kids. Kids are wrestling around, not paying attention. You see possible danger coming. What do you say? Watch out. Look out. Take a look. Be on guard. The reason that, that this is included in scripture, watch out, is because there's a risk for us to get tripped up and tangled and ensnared. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life doesn't consist in the abundance of possessions. Life is not about, you don't die with the most. You may die with the most, but you will still die. That what you have here at the end of the day will one day not be yours. What if this stuff you have is robbing you of the life you really want? I want to ask you a question this morning. What really matters to you? Now, Jesus <coughs> often addresses the things that matter, that the kingdom of God matters most, that our best life our, our, is lived in the context of his kingdom valuing the things that he values. And Jesus values people. I've watched people put stuff over others, much of my ministry. How do I live with this one handful sort of mindset? There are three thoughts that I have about this today that I think are good practices. And honestly, these are really practical, not so much theoretical ideas. These are things you can actually choose to do in order to be on guard against allowing your stuff to have you because you either have stuff or your stuff has you. And let me say this, I don't believe that stuff is bad or good. Stuff is neutral. How we use it is the question. And I also, when it comes to having stuff, there's nothing wrong with having stuff. But you have to make sure that your stuff doesn't have you. The first thing that I would say is throw it out. I mean, the reality is if your stuff is keeping you from a relationship with Jesus, if your stuff is keeping you from the peace and the promises God has offered, if your stuff is becoming a stumbling block for your obedience, if having the next thing is keeping you from stepping into obedience with God, throw it out. Free yourself of it. Some of your stuff is like a brick in your backpack weighing you down. Right now, I, I think I've been through three or four sizes in clothing in the last couple of years. And right now, walking into my closet, although it's stuffed full of stuff, I never know what will work because I don't know what fits. I'm getting fluffier right now. And, and part of that is, is, is I've got all these clothes in my closet and now the three or four things that I wear consistently, I hardly even put in the closet because I'm gonna wear them in a few days. And now walking into the closet is confusing for the amount of stuff. And the reality is I need to either give away or throw away much of the stuff that's in there. There's a story in scripture, Matthew chapter 19, when a man comes to Jesus and asks what he needs to, to do to be right with God. And it says he's a, a rich young man. And when the young, Jesus tells the rich young man that he basically needs to put God over his stuff, that his God has become his stuff and his wealth and his things and that he needs to give it away and come to him. Now, I don't think many of us would, uh, would love to be told that our, we had to get rid of all of our stuff. I think Jesus is not even necessarily saying that's the requirement, but the reality is in order to live an obedient life to God, we have to recognize that the stuff is his to begin with. And maybe we don't have to get rid of all of our stuff, but maybe we need to remind ourselves that what we have is actually God's. That when we become a part of his kingdom, that our resources become a part of his kingdom. And he tells the young man that, that he needs to give it away and, and follow him. And the, the young man went away sad because he had great wealth, the scripture says. Because the man went away unhappy. He continued to allow his stuff to rob from him. Now, I believe you can have stuff and there's nothing wrong with having stuff, but we can't let our stuff have us. 
and probably a good cleaning party where you look through and you ask yourself honestly, do I need to keep this? You know, how many of your kids' drawings and pictures do you really need to have in a tote in the basement? You think they're going to want them back? You know, so many of us, we, we, we don't get rid of things because we're afraid. We don't trust in God's provision to take care of us. So we keep a mass store of things. And there's nothing wrong in preparing for the future, but like you don't need 700 cans of corn in your pantry. And, and you won't consume them. And in the end, you'll actually be more wasteful by not consuming them. Are you, are you being, are, do you need to keep them? These are legitimate questions. People are afraid, well, maybe my kids will want them down the road. And I hate to tell you, your Ikea furniture is not going to go to the next generation in the same way that the oak furniture in the past did. Your kids are going to grow up and the stylistic things of furniture are not going to be the same. They may wind up taking a few things away while many of your things will be gone. Maybe we could actually buy less. David, King Solomon's father, lived with great wealth. And he recognized this danger that was in front of him as he had access to everything. And he asked God, he, he, asked God, he said, cause my heart to bow before your words of wisdom and not the wealth of this world. Are you trusting things with your security? And he goes on to say, help me turn my eyes away from illusions so that I pursue only that which is true. That there's this temptation to see the illusion out ahead of the thing that will give us peace, the thing that, that will give us security, the, the moment, the dollar that's enough to keep us secure. But it's an illusion because this is a temporary world. This world is not meant to be the home of a Christ follower. We live from where our, our citizenship is, and our citizenship is in God's kingdom. David's prayer is a noble prayer. Cause my heart to bow before your words of wisdom and not to the wealth of this world. Help me turn my eyes away from the illusions so that I pursue only that which is true. Parents, at the end of your life, I hope your children are telling stories of the moments of humanity they had with you, of the moments of love and connection, of moments of experience. If you were to go and ask many of the children in our children's ministry what they really want the most of, when they get beyond the little kid things of I'd like to have this and I'd like to have that, they really want time with you. Children often spell love, T-I-M-E. And so often we're robbed of our time. We don't realize that our time, our time often is given to things rather than people. Maybe we need to focus less on buying more. Maybe we need to buy less. Maybe, maybe having a consistent small handful of things and giving one away when we bring one in. Isn't it funny how like we can begin to, to I, I'm a bass fisherman and so like I, you give me a sporting goods catalog and I, I can look at lures and rods and reels and definitely boats and think, ooh, I'd like that. I, I, I mean, I want that. And over the years, I, I can go back through my tackle box and my tackle, and I can look at a rod that I bought, and I was like, oh, man, this is going to be the ticket. This is the perfect setup for what I want in order to catch fish the way I want to catch fish. This is the lure that someone was catching fish on last week, only to remember that that's how we were catching them 10 years ago, and things have changed. And now it's just two hooks on a piece of plastic in a box somewhere. And all of a sudden there are four full tackle boxes, but only one I take. Or there are rods and reels that sit in the corner because one time they were the right kind and now I've got something else. In reality, all of a sudden you can look at every corner in a garage and be like, oh, there are fishing rods. And I don't know about you, but I've never been good at fishing more than two or three rods at a time. Maybe we need to buy less. 
Maybe, maybe we need to, if we want to avoid falling into the trap of letting our stuff have us, maybe we need to give more. That when we recognize what we have as God's, that often what I let go of with one hand becomes a blessing in someone else's. That rather than letting my stuff have me, let someone have some of my stuff. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 through 19, the early church is wrestling with some of these things. It says, command those who are rich in this present world. And some of you listening to me today, you're like, oh, this is a money sermon. This is a, a, a stuff sermon. And, you know, okay, yeah, sure. The rich in this world need to not be arrogant. But I have to tell you, chances are pretty good if you're watching this video and you drove somewhere in an automobile today, you're in the top 7% of the wealthiest people in the world. So Timothy is saying, the, the writer is saying, command you and I not to be arrogant or put hope in wealth because it's uncertain. <laughs> you can talk to the generation that went through the Great Depression who, put their, who, who, who learned that, that their stuff couldn't hold them up in the middle of uncertainty. He says, but put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. God does want us to enjoy. God does want us, it's okay for us to have, but we have to be on guard to not put our hope in our stuff. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds and be generous and willing to share. You see, when we've entrusted that what we have is God's, we even trusted that it's for his good and his purposes. And we hold loosely onto what has been given to us, knowing that our real security comes in a relationship with Jesus. He's, and, and it goes on to say, in this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age. This is the idea that how we utilize what's in our hands actually has an impact on eternity. Much of the way we use the stuff that we have seems to have an impact for here. Why would we toil so much for something that has a temporary impact when we have the opportunity to lay up treasure as a firm foundation for the coming days? He says, so that they may, meaning others, take hold of the life that is truly life. Are you accumulating on earth what you cannot keep or are you investing in heaven what you cannot lose? I love you, Bethel. Have a great week. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Are you ready to take your next step? We would love to hear from you. You can send an email to hello at Bethel.us. You can send us a message on Facebook or you can let us know in the Bethel app. And speaking of the Bethel app, take a moment if you haven't already to go to your app store and search Bethel Putco to download our app. There's all kinds of great resources in the app. You can listen to messages, you can view the messages from Sunday morning, and you can also fill out a digital connect card. You can do that today and each week to let us know that you're tuning in. You can also find some great information about our Bethel Kids Ministry and our Be The One Student Ministries. Also in the app, you can give. It's one of three ways you can give. With online giving at Bethel.us slash give in our app, Bethel Putco, or through text. Hey, thanks again for joining us. We hope you have a great day and know that you are loved. <laughs>